And good morning. You're now listening to Kingston Community Radio, airing on FM 92.5 and AM 920, WGHQ, Kingston, New York. This programming is brought to you by our listeners and corporate underwriters who are interested in presenting local community radio. The opinions expressed on this program do not represent those of PAML Broadcasting or Kingston Community Radio. Listeners are encouraged to send in $10 per month to help bring this program to you. Mail your contributions to Kingston Community Radio, Post Office Box 4364, Kingston, New York, 12402. For more information or to donate online, visit our website at mykcr.org. Good morning. This is Dan Gatiss, and thank you for tuning in, sharing the morning with us, 7 to 9 a.m. every weekday, except for yesterday. We were 7 a.m. till 5 p.m. for the Happy Christmas Fund. And um, thank you for contributing and uh, being a part of that. It's 27 degrees right now here in Uptown Kingston on this November 5th. And we'll be right back after these messages. This fall, give us your best shot. Your photo of the Hudson Valley's autumn scenery could be worth $750. Enter Central Hudson's ninth annual Fall Foliage Contest today. If your photo gets the most likes on our Facebook page, you win. Deadline to enter is November 5th. For contest rules and information on how to submit your photo, go to Central Hudson's Facebook page or visit centralhudson.com. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, We'll probably stay together. Probably? It's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Dina Roy from Hurley, and I support the Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. And we're back. You're listening to KCR, Kingston Community Radio, WGHQ, 920 on your AM dial, 92.5 FM, and streaming online at mykcr.org. 331-9255 is our call-in number, 331-9255. And today, it's a fabulous Friday with Rick Rem Snyder. And uh, good morning, Rick. How are you? How are you doing? How you all doing there? <laughs> well, you know, I'm doing great. It's like uh, two days in a row on Kingston Community Radio. You know, that's uh, yesterday was exactly, had the eight, yes, 830 yes. spot and uh, over at Boyce's Dairy. So that was a great uh, day. And I heard we did pretty well. So uh, so thanks for all those people who came out. and uh, Yeah, generally three-fourths of the way to the goal. That's fantastic. Three-fourths of the way to the goal. The goal this year is $100,000, and we're close, very close to 70000 right now. Probably already there. Good. Well, mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we thank the community for that. It's a worthwhile cause. You know, the only thing I'm going to have to say uh, next year uh, I'm going to have to talk to Lawrence about scheduling me a little later because it's kind of hard to eat ice cream 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning over at Boyce's Dairy, you know? <laughs> I guess you could. I guess there could be some kind of ice cream breakfast, right? <laughs> <laughs> they have plenty of treats, though. So, uh, uh, But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it was nice to have uh, Mayor Noble stop by and got to chat with him a little bit. And Christine Hine popped in amongst uh, a lot of people. Uh, donating, so uh, that was a lot of fun, actually. We had a um, about uh, thirty different hosts. Wow! Th- throughout the course of the day, you you started it out. Yeah. After Tony and uh, Lawrence, you started it right out. Yep. Uh, with the first visiting guest, and then um, oh, it's about thirty more. 
Yeah, I got to see Don Williams. I haven't seen uh, Don for a while, and uh, he was next. So, uh, yeah, that was quite an impressive lineup. It went uh, was all uh, uphill after me, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> all uphill. Yeah, uh, I have a I have a list. up. I'll, I'll finally find it if you keep keep queuing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it but was, I do uh, have a fantastic list, and it is worth thanking them all. Yes, for, for having come in. Yes, uh, it's uh, plus, you know, it was a uh, little nippy. And uh, uh, did you make it over there to uh, Boyce's Brothers at the end of the day or no? Oh no, no, I was I was here, man, the whole day. The whole day, yeah, yeah I was. So it was nice in the, in the morning, uh, every, and they had a, a table set up uh, as you first came in, and of course had all these nice treats and uh, millions of uh, donuts and. Uh, uh, we have to thank the people at uh, at Boyce's Dairy for uh, being uh, so hospitable and uh, great uh, great host for the day, and uh, so that was nice. George Post dropped by with one of my loyal uh, friends and callers and uh, erstwhile golfer at uh, Green Acres. He he stopped by, which was nice, and uh, it was a really good day. I'm it hoping was, it was a really remarkable day. Did you find that list or no? I, no, I uh, thought I uh, popped it in with my um, cue sheets here, but I uh, I don't have it. Well, anybody it's that knows. It's a great tribute. Anyway, it's a we great thank them all. To, uh, yeah, and it's a great tribute to Walter Maxwell. Yes. Who, uh, between him and Harry Thayer, um, founded it, founded the Happy Christmas Fund. Yeah, well, they've raised a ton of money through the years, which is nice. And. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, like I said before, a worthwhile cause. Um, it was nice to talk to Mayor Noble. I hadn't seen him a while because, as you know, I'm a, a big sports fan, and we're talking about the renovations at D Stadium. So that uh, got a little update on that. And even though it was a little noisy and a little hard to hear on occasion, I believe the mayor said that uh, next year Kingston High School will be playing football and then uh, at the stadium, and then once they're done with the season, they're going to have the renovation start, and the following year, Kingston High Football will be on the road. So I believe it's a little over, and if, Steve, you're listening and I'm wrong, I apologize. You can call in and correct me, but I believe the construction is going to be uh, happening uh, after that. I see Dan has come up with a list. Let's let's hear that uh, is, illustrious a lineup. Fantastic uh, tribute to everyone who came in to host uh, obviously, Rick Grim Snyder um, kicked us off at 8:30. Um, after Tony and Lawrence uh, did all the welcoming and introductions, and then Don Williams um, with Tony Marmo um, keeping him in check. Crystal Palumbo, sales manager from Stewart's Shop, um, popped in. Wayne Winkler, Guy Greco uh, came in from the uh, Mid Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union, who is a great underwriter. And um, Kingston Lions Club, who is also a great underwriter, Kevin Gilfeather. John Burlingham and uh, Dory Dabney came in. And uh, 11 a.m. to uh, 12, uh, the great, uh, the, the very, very great Bob Circusano and Greg Shorvis uh, kicking through about $10,000 during at least that much uh, during their hour. And the same with law enforcement uh, from 12 to 1. Uh, for a whole hour. Uh, we had uh, Eric Benjamin, uh, Chief Berardi, I think um, Egidio Tinti uh, popped in for a little while. Marianne de Groot kept them under uh, uh, under control. <laughs> <laughs> and Mario Restivo from uh, New York State Police. He's the captain now. And uh, Jennifer Fabiano and um, uh, uh, let's see who else, uh, Kathleen and a, a couple other people from Roundout Savings Bank. And then Val Dwyer and Tony Marmo um, did a great uh, job between 1.30 and 2. And Dr. Ed Alio uh, did an enormously good job for uh, being a, uh, a, uh, a tenderfoot mm. with, uh, this, um, uh, with this um, operation here. 2 o'clock to 2.30, Dr. Ed Alio really raised a lot of good money, too. That's great. And, um, and then we had uh, Dennis Larios from... Uh, uh, Brenier and Larios uh, at 2.30 and 3, 2.30 to 3. And then Bill Cuervis, Ulster Savings Bank, and a couple other team members from Ulster Savings Bank were there. Uh, and they are also a KCR underwriter, 3 to 3.30. And then Bill Calderera, um, 
um, of Ulster Savings Bank and uh, uh, a couple other people from um, let's see Richard Catabiani uh, from the Kingston Rotor- Rotary Club because they kind of represented both Ulster Savings Bank and the Rotary Club at the same time, 3.30 to 4. And then Mario Catalano and Hugh Reynolds uh, comes in at 4, and from 4 to 4.30. Thank you, guys. Uh, they did a great job, too. And then Cameron Rylance and Nina Postupak closed the day. Wow. So did, I didn't stick around, obviously. I, I popped in, listened to it uh, occasionally. How long did uh, Lawrence and uh, Tony stay, stay for? The, were they the whole, the oh, whole they were time? There, yeah, just like me here. They yeah. were there for the entire duration, wow. all the way from 7 a.m. Well, actually, Lawrence got there at 6 a.m. <laughs> and we did a uh, sound check at about 6.30, and we were ready to go from 7 a.m. till 5 p.m. Wow, I'll give them a lot of credit for uh, what job well done there yes. the whole day. Yes, that... essentially Tony was there the entire day. Wow. As well as Lawrence. Lawrence told a funny story about when his father was alive and how the technology has changed. I don't know if you were listening or not, but yeah, he said the, they had this little uh, box there that uh, I'm not that tech savvy, but, you know. Yeah, it was a, a Marty, uh, probably a, a Marty box that you can take, and uh, you can actually use the Marty amplifier on site and take it and that's your uh, that's your uh, transmitter right in the old days he said he was sort of out there with an antenna exactly his father tra- oh no move this way oh, a little higher a little <laughs> lower <laughs> to get to the station yes right and then you had a receiver's uh, antenna at the station at the time because you didn't you didn't have phone connection right you had to do it uh, with rf wow now we're back to that <laughs> yeah, it's uh, technology has advanced a little bit, but I yeah, couldn't. That was it comes a funny back around. Yeah, funny story at, uh, that Lawrence was talking about him and his father. So well deserved. I don't see Lawrence here in this morning, so uh, well deserved day off. I'm sure. Absolutely. Yep. 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 So yeah, it's it is a well deserved day. So off. what else is going on today? It's a little nippy out there. If you don't have, I still don't have my uh, scraper. I don't know where it is. So <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, you'll dig it up. And, um, yeah, so far it's just been a little bit of frost on the windows. And I just went out 10 minutes early just to make sure the car warmed up and I had right. a windshield. Because <laughs> well, it was not, frosty. Yeah, yeah, not a bad move. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm covering some uh, high school football games this weekend. They, they're starting the Section 9 playoffs. So that's going to be a little chilly tonight at uh, 7 o'clock uh, when I cover a game at Wallkill. But, uh, oh, wow. That's fantastic. That's got to be a lot of fun. You do play-by-play? No, I'm, I, I work for uh, uh, some newspapers in Southern Ulster County, and I cover, uh, so I write stories and take photos. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I do mostly uh, Southern Ulster County. Uh, you know, teams like uh, Marlboro are really good. Wallkill's good this year. Highland, uh, occasionally Newburgh. So uh, this weekend's the Section 9 playoffs. So uh, it's a little bittersweet because this is the first year that they haven't had any playoff games at Deed Stadium. I see. And uh, so unfortunately, is, the former Section 9 chairman and the person who was most responsible for getting games at Deed Stadium, John Ford, former New Paltz coach and athletic director, passed away. So I don't uh, believe they didn't put in a bid this year. Or if they did put in a bid, it didn't happen. And uh, that's one of the reasons when I was talking to the mayor yesterday is that it's really important that uh, uh, Deed Stadium, uh, that renovation goes through because they're losing a lot of revenue to host not only playoff games but all kinds of different high school uh, sporting events Mm -hmm. that uh, have now gone to places like Middletown High School, which has a great complex, Fowler Field. You know, Goshen High School has a nice field now. So uh, anyway, but it's fun to cover those high school games. Hopefully uh, they'll get back to Kingston after they get the renovations in a couple years because that that generates a lot of revenue. Yes, and it'll it'll probably be exponentially more revenue once the uh, uh, the whole infrastructure of the stadium is complete. Yeah, because I mean, there's it's very deficient in many areas. Um, Yeah, you know, with the uh, with the vending and with the uh, with the uh, locker rooms and things like that, it's very deficient for the kind of conferences that uh, that that want to use a, a good facility. You're being very kind with the word deficient. (laughs) <laughs> okay yes uh, i this, haven't this more than deficient <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's exactly why we have to i, I guess uh steve said that we're going to take a year to to yeah. rebuild it yeah and they're going to need to uh, uh replace the uh turf there it's uh, i don't know it's been i 
I don't want to, it's been at least 10 years, probably longer. But, you know, it's interesting, mm -hmm. that complex, even though it's not up to par, uh, the is very busy with people, the community at large, walking absolutely. around the track. Absolutely, absolutely. Everybody takes advantage of the sidewalks up above the stadium. Yep. And the paths into Forsyth Park. Correct. And then to the, uh, our little mini zoo. <laughs> yep. And uh, all that the Nature Center gives, all that Nature uh, Center offers. It's a fabulous footprint. Yes. There is no problem with the Deet Stadium footprint. Correct. It's in great shape when it comes to the amount of space it has and the uh, uh, the amount of parking that's available is primo. Pretty, yes, you're very right. good. And the thing about it that is good for uh, uh, playoff games that bring other uh, bring people from upstate and wherever, even uh, uh, you know Westchester and, and different places where they they come in to have the the quarterfinals, the semifinals, is the location is fantastic. Because it's so centrally located, you know, people, the teams from the Albany area uh, and further up Syracuse come down. And, uh, well, not quite Syracuse. Syracuse is in for the finals, but upstate mostly. I see. And, you know, all you have to do is get off the thruway and bang, you're right there. So the location. It's incredibly convenient, and yes. There's all kinds of hotels and restaurants uh, right, right near there. the stadium. Absolutely. So. There's four or five uh, hotels um, right in the uh, vicinity right there. Yeah. So once they and I know that the, I believe the mayor said uh, the the price tag was somewhere in the neighborhood of fourteen fifteen million. So they're going to do an extensive uh, renovation. Uh, the bat, like you said, the bathrooms, the, the new concession stand, the locker rooms. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, I won't be there this weekend. I'll be out on the road and places like Wallkill and Marlboro. And uh, but they, you know, one thing, Dan. A lot of the local high schools uh, in Ulster County are really ahead of the times because uh, places like Marlboro and Wallkill have now uh, they have turf fields. They're not they're not grass anymore. They have the artificial turf. So sure. I'll go to other places outside the county and it'd be like a mud bowl. So <laughs> Ulster Ulster County is some of the a lot of the schools some in the Rondell Valley wow, has a new, great new complex really with good with uh, like AstroTurf. Well, it's a huge, huge, huge benefit to. Uh, to outfit uh, your school with fabulous uh, sports uh, facilities and fabulous entertainment facilities. The, aud the auditoriums are oftentimes primo as well. Yep. So yeah. we're, uh, we're really uh, ahead of the game mostly in Ulster County. So, uh, so what else is cooking? Anything? What are you up to this weekend? Anything exciting? Um, my weekend usually um, uh, centers around uh, uh, serving French food. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the time being. Yeah. I'm usually at uh, Le Canard en Chenet Friday night and Saturday night, and uh, we'll have a fabulous uh, uh, weekend. Had a great night last night, and uh, it'll um, escalate and uh, ramp up as uh, we get closer to the seasons. It's been a – how is the uh, is the restaurant business still doing pretty well after, after the, you know, the throes of the pandemic and uh, what have you? Yes. Yes, I think that uh, um, those restaurants who uh, held court and stayed um, stayed uh, along with the uh, the county mandates of um, just using outside, just doing takeout. First, it's first it was just doing takeout, and then sure. it was, and then it turned into just doing takeout and outside. You could use outside, so that became quite popular, very popular for those restaurants that. Um, kept you know stayed the course as right. we would say um and um uh, i i think that um most of the uptown restaurants that um you know stayed the course and kept going are are ramping up right now and they're they're growing and they're doing very well well that's good to hear you know yeah very few closed and i think that maybe one or two of them that did close probably might have been you know on the teetering on closing anyway or, or, or wanting to change sure. course. A couple retired, you know, think that kind of a thing. A couple restaurants in, uh, in the vicinity. Right. Uh, the people uh, took, took, took the opportunity to retire. And, uh, well, I could tell you one place that's doing well, and we uh, were uh, hoping to have uh, the owner 
in a couple weeks is uh, Moonburger. That place. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, Jeremy. Uh, what a hit. What a hit that restaurant is. He hit that He's out of the ballpark. That's and, right. um, you know, it's just. Uh, it's like, a, it was the perfect storm. Yes. <laughs> it was. You know, he, I, and, uh, I wondered. Kudos, kudos to them. Yeah, um, no. And um, their, um, I, I, their biggest challenge right now is to uh, uh, create the uh, workflow that's uh, necessary for such volume. Because they yeah. have quite a lot of volume, and you don't you don't want people waiting two hours for uh, for their meal. Um, Twenty minutes is good, no problem. Sure, no problem there. But um, yeah, yeah, I would say that uh, the biggest challenge is to uh, is to uh, get that workflow going because yeah. they really hit a stride. I can <laughs> attest that the food is really good, and uh, you know, uh, if you're uh, a hamburger aficionado. Uh, it's not beef, but it's uh, it's impossible to tell it's not beef. The right. burger and the fries are very good, mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, you know they have a basic uh, uh, menu. And uh, I start to see the lines a little bit uh, subsiding. I think they're starting to get the the flow a little better, and people are my, maybe uh, realizing that they can't show up at six o'clock and have a ten minute, uh, which is a ten Meal, minute right, wait. Right, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you need exactly. to plan it a little better, but I'm sure things. I know Jeremy wants. I've seen the owner. I've seen him out there, and uh, you know, thanking the people for coming, and uh, you know, helping with the orders and what have you to yeah, move exactly. things along. Mm-hmm. So you do everything when you're the proprietor. You do everything. You do the bathrooms. You do the floors. You do everything, and you are always in touch with the customers. Yeah, That's and good. I I wondered. Be I got to be honest with you. <clears throat> the location there. I wondered if that would be a <clears throat> you know. A, it's kind of a small area there, and they do the turnaround when they come in, but it's really uh, working out well. Good. Uh, yep. So, Good. So uh, I know that uh, he's really enthusiastic. So we'll hope to, uh, I know he's busy. We'll try to get him on the air uh, in a couple weeks. But uh, Early morning is a good time. Yeah. Yeah, because usually it's, it's, it's found time, you know, as we do ourselves. And the thing, the thing I like not only about the, uh, the food being great, but – uh, on the um, on the menu, uh, there's a um, you can go there and um, the QR code code you can you can shoot the QR code and mm-hmm. it'll sh- uh, come up with places where you can visit and eat your meal uh, locally. You know, nice little venues, right. which is a, I don't know who came up with that marketing. That is ploy. very very good. I yeah, mean, that is right down your alley. That yes. is a really nice. Um, uh, feature yeah. uh, to uh, oh, there's four picnic tables over at Forsyth or something like that, very close by. Yeah, yeah, very good. So now, I don't know who their marketing person is, but they, they uh, might be Jeremy and the owner himself. But uh, did a uh, great job, and maybe some of the other uh, takeout places would think of that uh, down the road themselves. So, uh, but he's obviously that uh, is very progressive. That's very very progressive to uh, to. Um, because it's um it's a support system for the community, yes. To provide that kind of um, that kind of um, you know park faci- you know park uh, resources and things like that right there at uh, the restaurant. Yeah. So um, well, th- I'm glad glad they're doing well. I know Jean Jacques is uh, doing well. This is true. Yeah. yeah. And all of the other restaurants. Uh, Great yeah. job. Steak and Chops, you know, which is across the street from us, is um, busy. Yeah. It, keep, it keeps very busy. Um, uh, downtown restaurants, forget about it. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> you're, uh, you're in good shape. you got to make a reservation for uh, Savona's. or um, It's a very good idea to make a reservation for Ship to Shore or Savona's. Um, Savannah, not so much because there's so much seating. But uh, Yeah. But uh, downtown is sometimes we never leave from downtown on our days off. We just hang out in the restaurants right downtown. Armadillo. Yeah, I mean they know what they're doing Fantastic. downtown. You know, yeah. it's uh, we, our tourism office used to be down there. So uh, even though uh, we work down there, I know that 
you know, lunch was kind of the place, the time to go for us because, oh, sure. you know, dinner went, well, we're done at five, but, you know, like you said, the when you get there on the weekends from uh, five o'clock on a Friday and throughout the Saturday and then Sunday, it's just, you know, it's, jamming. It's, it's jamming. It's jamming. And there's the, then there's that new restaurant that's right up on Broadway, pretty much across from where your um, uh, tourism office was. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, um, it's a simple name. Wonderful place, and um, a little hard to get in. Right? Know? They have they have shorter hours too, but you know it's 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 similar to Moonburger. It's a it's not a, mole or no. not mole. No, no mole is it's always busy too. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're very fortunate that the uh, restaurateurs we have uh, obviously know what they're doing and know how to market their business, and the food is very good. So uh, uh, it's it, we're glad to have them. We're going to have uh, in two weeks. We're going to have Jess Davis from Jess Delicious from the Ulster County Regional Chamber, and her thing is food and promoting food with videos and. Uh, so we can talk more about that uh, when in a couple weeks. So we have a. Uh, we have Greg Herinja. All right. So uh, very happy to welcome my good friend. Greg, how you doing this morning? Hey, Rick. How's it going? I'm doing well. Well, I'm doing great, and uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, coming on early. And uh, uh, it's uh, we're, I wanted to get you on because uh, we have the NBA season started already, and you're the net, our, our resident NBA expert, and we yeah. want to talk a little bit about uh, your alma mater, Marist Basketball, too. So uh, I'm sure you've been uh, – for the listeners who have had John – I had John a couple months ago. Just give us a, a quick uh, – uh, a background and uh, when you covered the Nets and who you did it for, and of course mention uh, your fantastic book, which I am um, getting through. I'm, I, I'm not done yet, but I'm getting through it. That's okay. There's no rush. So, uh, <laughs> so I covered the Nets starting in the 2009-2010 season. So that's when they were 12 and 70 and playing in the uh, Izod Center. So they've certainly come a long way. I covered them for seven years. Uh, during that time, I wrote a book uh, called The Five-Year Plan, The Nets' Tumultuous Journey from New Jersey to Brooklyn, and it kind of highlighted all the things that, uh, that they did under, uh, under Billy King and former owner Mikhail Prokhorov to uh, kinda, kind of uh, a get-rich-quick scheme in terms of winning quickly uh, instead of, uh, I guess if you were to look at uh, the Sean Marks Nets, uh, where he plucked talent from and how he uh, parlayed that into, uh, into better players and, and better things. So uh, it was looking at that previous regime and uh, and what they did and uh, and yeah and I did that for seven years so 2016 was uh, was my last season and the book is uh, still available on Amazon and uh, about uh, almost 400 pages so if you uh, enjoy reading about basketball uh, it's available there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I I tell people that it's uh, uh, you can get it you can get it on Amazon, right? Yeah, that's how. So uh, people, it's still out there. If you're a if you're a pro basketball fan and particularly a Nets fan, it's something interesting to read. Uh, a lot of good insight. Uh, you started at Marist. Uh, you were the beat writer for the men's team. And uh, what year did you graduate from Marist? Yeah, so that's uh, that's how we met. So I mean, I uh, I started at Marist in 2005 and started covering uh, that team in 2006, and then I graduated in 2009. So I had uh, a couple years of varying uh, experiences with uh, with covering Marist basketball. So I mean, it, if you think about uh, my sophomore year when they had Jared Jordan and Will Whittington and uh, and those guys, and were picked to go to the NCAA tournament, even though they didn't quite get there. But uh, and then it was a uh, a, a slow, uh, a slow uh, slog downhill after that. And so my <laughs> senior year was uh, was the Chuck Martin uh, Red Foxes, uh, where they uh, they they started struggling, and uh, and hopefully now they're uh, they're coming back up the hill, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, we're seeing a new brand of uh, Maris basketball now. But uh, towards the tail end there, it uh, you know the team wasn't as good as when I arrived at Maris in 2005. Yeah, we'll get into Marist a little, little more in, uh, later in the show. But uh, I was covering. I'm sure you were there uh, when they had that shocking loss in uh, Bridgeport in the semifinals 
uh, loss to uh, arch rival Siena, and uh, yeah. uh, I, I remember walking in the uh, the locker room and just seeing the faces of uh, Jared Jordan, Will Winnington, and, and uh, it was uh, it was it was hard for those guys because they really really had a great team, and uh, it just didn't happen that afternoon. Although they did go on and win a game in the NIT, right? Yeah, against uh, Oklahoma State. Right, so uh, it was somewhat of a consolation. Well, let's talk about the Nets. I guess first and foremost, uh, you know, everybody has picked the Nets uh, preseason. Uh, pretty much uh, all the experts have them, or uh, the Lakers one and two. Uh, so, what's the deal with Kyrie? What's your prediction on Kyrie Irving? Is he when is he coming back, or is he coming back? Well, he's not going to come back if it's for getting the vaccine. So, I mean, his hope at this point is that it's at some point that uh, New York City reverses that mandate. Um, you know, with Eric Adams uh, winning his election, you know, there's been a lot of talk that at some point they'll revisit that. Um, it, it's, it's hard for me to know. I mean, it's, uh, that's probably a better question for somebody from uh, the CDC to know whether that's a good <laughs> idea of reversing a mandate that seemingly worked. Um, but from just from knowing him and, you know, even from years of covering him and whatnot, I don't see him uh, budging off of, off of that. I think that this is the hill that, uh, you know, maybe a bad turn of phrase, but the hill that he wants to die on. You know, I mean, he, he is uh, stuck in on this position that uh, he's not going to get the vaccine and he doesn't want to put anything in his body or be told to put anything in his body that isn't a choice of his own. Um and you've seen other players, like Andrew Wiggins before the season was someone who was in a similar situation who uh, with the Golden State Warriors where he wasn't going to be able to play if he didn't get vaccinated. And he wound up getting vaccinated because he didn't want to turn down the money and he wanted to play. Uh, in Kyrie's case, I mean, Kyrie is still making $17 million this year to not play basketball. So, I mean, it, you know, there's not really a financial incentive uh, for him to come back. I mean, I'm sure that he wants to play with Durant and Harden and all that, but I, I think that he's uh, a very principled uh, man, even if they're misguided principles, and so I, I don't see him at any point just showing up uh, uh, to practice one day saying, hey, I was at CVS last night and I got vaccinated, so I don't, I don't think you know we're going to look forward to that. Uh, I think that if, if he was going to budge off that stance, he probably would have done it months ago, so uh, I think the uh, the best case scenario for the Nets is uh, is any local uh, lawmaking change that says that a performer doesn't have to be vaccinated, which is entirely possible. Uh, whether or not it's the prudent thing to do, whether or not it'll happen, uh, whether uh, I mean we've we've already seen a number of teams have guys enter the the health and safety protocol over the last week. I mean Tobias Harris with the Philadelphia 76ers, the Cleveland Cavaliers have had a bunch of guys with it, uh, Larry Markinen and Kevin Love are the two most well-known ones. So, I mean, the fact that you have some guys still entering the protocol, uh, and even if you go over to the NFL, uh, you know, and Aaron Rodgers testing positive, it's not like the virus is gone, uh, you know. So, I mean, there's, the leagues are still grappling with this. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if they're they're willing to, to step back off that mandate. Um, if they do, uh, you know, maybe mid-January or, you know, late January, early February after they ramp them up, if, if that is the case. Um, but, I mean, as it stands now, I have a hard time believing with guys still entering the protocol that, uh, that a big city like New York would move off of that. Well, I guess we'll uh, we'll just have to see what develops. Uh, uh, Greg, we're going to take a, a little two-minute break or so, so hang on, hold there, and uh, we'll be right back with uh, Greg Grinia talking about uh, the NBA and Marist College basketball. Okay, and thank you, Rick Remsnyder, and a very, very special thanks to Greg Grinia for uh, uh, calling in today, and uh, we'll be right back with Greg in a few minutes. Uh, this is WGHQ AM 920 and 92.5 FM. Still about 27 degrees here in uptown Kingston on this uh, November 5th, and um, uh, thank you for being with us this morning. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio has been brought to you by Baum Real Estate, Robert Baum Real Estate, and... Um, 
That's Commercial Realty, located at 79 St. James Street, Kingston, New York. Visit rgbaum.com for more information. We'll be right back after these quick messages. This fall, give us your best shot. Your photo of the Hudson Valley's autumn scenery could be worth $750. Enter Central Hudson's 9th Annual Fall Foliage Contest today. If your photo gets the most likes on our Facebook page, you win. Deadline to enter is November 5th. For contest rules and information on how to submit your photo, go to Central Hudson's Facebook page or visit centralhudson.com. Introducing the YMCA. Sure, you know the Y for a swim or a game of hoops, but we're more than that. We're a cause. When you take a jump shot at the Y, someone else is getting job training. Practice yoga as a team practices her leadership skills. We give people of all ages, incomes, and backgrounds a chance to learn, grow, and thrive. So while you might think of the Y as the place for lifting weights, we're also about lifting entire communities. That's the Y. We're so much more. Visit ymca.net slash more. Hi, this is Cameron Rylands from Kingston, and I support Kingston Community Radio because it's informative. And this last segment of Kingston Community Radio has been brought to you by Robert Baum Commercial Realty, located 79 St. James Street here in Kingston, New York. Visit rgbaum.com for more information. This upcoming portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Many locations throughout the Mid-Hudson Valley, one near you. A little bit about the weekend weather, mostly sunny today, uh, with a high of 51, mainly clear skies tonight, with a low down to 28. Saturday, mainly sunny, with a high of 52. Wow, warming trend. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be sunny all day Saturday. And mostly clear skies Saturday night with a low down to 28 again. And uh, Sunday, partly cloudy skies in the morning, give wing, giving way to uh, cloudy skies during the afternoon with a high of 53. And uh, a low on Sunday night of 34 degrees. And uh, let's get back to Rick Rem Snyder and Greg um, for this next segment of Kingston Community Radio, a fabulous Friday. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, by the way, um, we uh, ha- anybody like to call in? I'd uh, love to hear your input about uh, the NBA, Marist, anything else that's on your mind. Three three one nine two five five. We're on Kingston Community Radio with Greg Rinya. Greg, so uh, clear something up for me. Uh, s- the Kyrie is getting paid half his salary because uh, he could play on road games, but uh, the Nets uh, told him to stay home, which I think is the, the right move. So he, he is getting half his salary. Exactly. So, I mean, if he, he were to play a full season and be vaccinated, he would make about $34 million. Uh, the fact that he's not allowed to play in home games because of the the mandate in uh, in New York City, that makes him ineligible to be paid for those games. But, I mean, if the Nets wanted, they could just have Kyrie playing road games. So, I mean, when they go to Detroit tonight, they theoretically uh, are within their right to bring Kyrie along with them and have him play. But since that's their decision, not his decision, to not play in those road games, uh, they're on, on the hook for for the road games. So, basically, he's getting half his salary, half the games that the Nets told him to uh, to stay home and not be part of the team. All right, so I, I'm going to make a little prediction here. You're, you're the NBA expert, but I'm going to I'm going to go the other way. I say that Kyrie, at some point, maybe just before Christmas, he needs a little money to to get a few Christmas presents. He said, you know, I'm leaving seventeen million dollars uh, on the table. I'm very principled, but I think I've made my point. So I think before. Uh, the January one, we're going to see uh, Mr. Irving make a statement, and he'll be back in uh, uh, uniform. I can't see any athlete leaving seventeen million dollars on the table, but that's just my my uh, prediction. So we'll see what happens. Uh, barring that happening, are the Nets good enough to win without him? Uh, with uh, if KD, Kevin Durant, and James Harden stay healthy, can they win the title even without uh, uh, Kyrie Irving? 
Well, I think the uh, the key phrase that you said there was if they stay healthy. So, I mean, I think if uh, Kevin Durant is uh, completely healthy and Harden works his way into shape, I mean, they're as good as anybody. So, I mean, it, you know, they're definitely, uh, you know, in the top two or three teams. So, I mean, they'd probably still be the betting favorite. Uh, I think the uh, the question that people would have is, will Kevin Durant, uh, be able to carry this team the entire the entire way. But so, so far through eight games, uh, five and three star. I mean, he's playing arguably the best basketball of his career, and it's been a storied career so far. So I mean, he's been great. Uh, Harden has struggled out of the gate, and so I think uh, last week you saw it a little bit with Durant getting ejected versus Detroit, and then throwing the ball into the stands, which should have gotten him ejected against Indiana. There's a little bit of frustration because I think he probably looks at it and says. I'm supposed to have Kyrie here with me. I don't have that. Uh, you know, I'm supposed to have James Harden, a perennial MVP candidate, and he's looked nothing like that up to this point. He's looked more like Darren Williams than, than James Harden uh, to date, and maybe the rule changes have had something to do, to do with that. Um, but he, he's been, he was quoted, uh, uh, or those around him were quoted, uh, the reason why he didn't go to the Knicks was that he wasn't interested in saving their franchise. Well, right now he's being asked to put the entire Nets franchise on his back, and he doesn't have necessarily the help that he thought he was going to have. But all that said, if he's healthy, um, you know, he's arguably the best player in the league, if not in the top two, with Giannis Antetokounmpo. So, I mean, I think that any team that Kevin Durant is on is uh, is a threat to win it all. Uh, if he's healthy and if Harden's healthy, uh, there, there's certainly a, a chance that uh, that they that they go to the finals. Um but that'll be interesting to see. But they do have an older roster, and uh, most of the guys have been in the league more than a decade. I mean, I think aside from the rookies who really aren't expected to play much of a role, Joe Harris and DeAndre Bembry are the only guys who who are really, you know, in their prime years in terms of you know in their their mid twenties. Uh, every other guy has been been in the league over ten years. Uh, we look at Patty Mills, Lamar, Marcus Aldridge, Paul Millsap. I mean, it is an older roster from that standpoint, James Johnson, and then you take into account Durant being around a while, although still in his prime, Harden being in the league a while, a lot of miles on him. So, I mean, if they can stay healthy, I mean, they would certainly be my pick, um, but we'll see if the uh, we'll see how they fare in, in the grind of an 82-game season and the playoffs. Who do you like uh, among the new complementary uh, players that Sean Marks picked up in the offseason for the Nets? Oh, I think uh, far and away it's been Patty Mills, uh, uh, a guard who spent, uh, you know, the majority of his career with San Antonio before coming to Brooklyn. I mean, there's that familiarity with Sean Marks, uh, who was with the Spurs before coming to the Nets. Uh, I mean, he opened the season, I want to say, in the first two or three games, shooting about 70% from three. I think he hit his first maybe 10 threes on the season. So, I mean, he's he's a, a battle-tested player. He played uh, for Australia in the Olympics and was arguably one of the best players uh, in the Olympics last summer, you know, except for Kevin Durant. Uh, you know, you could probably look at Patty Mills and say he was probably the second or third best player uh, in the world. So, I mean, he's uh, he's battle-tested. He's, he's been in big games with the Spurs. He's been in big games with Australia. Uh, he can shoot the lights out of the ball, uh, knows how to play the right way. Uh, I thought that that was... Uh, Probably their biggest pickup, and he's probably going to serve as as their sixth uh, sixth man off the bench uh, this year. So I thought that that was uh, that was going to be a coup for whichever team signed him. Uh, you know, of all the big players, and I think the fact that the Nets were able to add that shooting to go along with Joe Harris's shooting just further adds uh, adds uh, a lot of uh, outside skill from the perimeter for uh, for Durant and for Harden. And I mean, you know, Harden even with his struggles getting to the line and shooting. Has still been racking up assists, and I think when you have guys like uh, Harris and now Patty Mills, uh, that gives them an outlet to uh, to drive and kick. And uh, if they have an open shot, uh, they're more than likely to make it. Aldridge has looked pretty good coming back after last year, uh, his short retirement due to heart problems. So uh, I think he's a big pickup in the middle there. I like that mid-range jumper that he. Uh, that's almost automatic when that 15, 16 footer he has. Sure, uh, yeah, you could label him the king of the mid-range. Uh, it seems like, uh, well, he and Durant both have uh, had that, that 18-footer uh, down down pat. So, I mean, uh, he's been great, too. I mean, 
with him, I guess that my concern would be not even so much the heart problem since he's been cleared from that, uh, just will he withstand an 82-game season? And then will he, when asked, uh, be able to go up against a guy like Embiid, uh, a guy like uh, Jokic, let's say, if we're talking about the finals? Uh, because it seems like the Nets pretty much doubled down on their small ball philosophy. I wouldn't really uh, you know, label him like a big burly center. He's more of a guy who wants to play outside. So, I mean, it, you know, if he's asked to guard Giannis or if he's asked to guard Embiid, uh, the guys they'd probably have to go through, uh, you know, to get to the finals uh, to where, the, you know, they could face a guy like a Gobert or uh, a Nikola Jokic. You know, how, how will that uh, matchup play out? But, I mean, his, his offense has been uh, has been nothing short of excellent. You know, I mean, he's he's hit most of his mid-range shots, he shoots over 50% seemingly every game. So, I mean, he has, he's also been a big pickup. Uh, you're totally right about that. You mentioned um, Joel Embiid and the Sixers. What a mess that is. What, what do you think is going to happen ultimately with the Ben Simmons fiasco? Is he ever going to play? Or they, They've obviously couldn't get rid of him. Uh, they couldn't trade him in the offseason. They're probably asking for way too much. What what, what do you see the end game uh, there? And uh, will the Sixers finally get straightened out be, uh, You know, when we start getting into the meat of the schedule? Yeah, ironically, the Sixers have started off really well. They're seven and two. Uh, the concern that I would have for them is that it seems like Joel Embiid is uh, is dealing with knee soreness and is banged up a little bit. And you figure nine games into an eighty-two game season, at, after having a full off season, uh, for him to already be facing injury questions, that's probably not a great sign. Uh, so, despite them having played well, the fact that they don't have an All Star caliber player on the floor, or at the very least, to be able to trade him for something that could turn into a few more pieces that could further assist Embiid and Tobias Harris and Seth Curry. Uh, it's problematic, and, and I mean, at this point, um, I think uh, Ben Simmons is only there so that he collects his money. So, I mean, he's not as charitable as Kyrie Irving willing to walk away from $17 million. Ben Simmons wants his money, and I think that he realized that by showing up and, you know, saying that he has a back injury and that, he, you know, he's not mentally ready to play, uh, all those things are basically, I think, uh, in an effort for him to to still get paid without actually having to take the floor for the 76ers. So, I mean, as you said, it is a mess. The problem, the problem for Ben Simmons is that I, I don't see how he, he gets traded. So, I mean, if his wish is to be traded, he's not doing anything to make other teams want to trade for him. You know, I mean, it's the same thing in, in Kyrie's case where how can you trade for a guy who you don't know if he, what you're getting when he shows up, if he shows up. So, I mean, in Ben Simmons' case, how do you expect Philadelphia to flip him for, you know, let's use Portland as an example. Uh, how are they going to trade him for C.J. McCollum when Portland will say, well, you know, we haven't seen Ben Simmons play in a while, and the last time we saw him play, he didn't look that good. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> he has to take some ownership, too, for the reason why Philadelphia was unhappy with him in the first place. I mean, he's been in the league five, six years, and he hasn't gotten any better in that time. I mean, he hasn't worked on his game. I mean, if you look at... Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, I mean, he couldn't shoot a lick when he came into the league. And now no one is going to confuse him with Kevin Durant shooting the ball, but he can still go out and, and make a shot uh, from time to time. And so he's clearly worked on that. I mean, you saw in the finals, in the final, in the, the clinching game, he went, uh, I believe it was 16 for 19 from the free throw line. So, I mean, he put in the work to, to become a better player. Ben Simmons is still ha- still has the same... Um, faults that he did when he entered the league. So, I mean, he's a, a wonderful defensive player. He's a good ball handler. Um, but there seems to be that mental block of he doesn't want to miss shots, so he's not willing to take them. And I think that's what uh, annoyed Philadelphia. Now, he doesn't want to play for Philadelphia because they were annoyed with his faults and not gushing over what he does offer. Um, but what, what he does offer limited them in, in the playoffs last year against Atlanta. He was practically unplayable late in some of those games because of his poor free throw shooting, shooting in, you know, in the, in the, thir- the 30 percent range. Uh, it's tough to have your point guard on the floor at that point late in the game uh, in that situation. But uh, I really don't know how it ends because, uh, I mean, I'm sure they're still working hard to trade him. Daryl Morey is... Uh, has placed a firm line in the sand and said, I'm not going to move him unless it's for a deal that makes sense. They don't want to give him up for 30 cents on a dollar. I mean, he still is a guy who has made, you know, several all-star teams. He's a perennial defensive player of the year candidate. So, I mean, he still does offer something. 
Um, but with him not playing, why would another GM uh, give up assets to attain a guy who, uh, you know, their, their last vision of him was uh, coming up quite small in the, in the Eastern Conference Finals against Atlanta. So, I mean, um, it, it is a mess. I think Philadelphia would be much better served, uh, not only with his presence, just because he adds, adds another another body there, but also if they, they could trade him and turn him into a couple of rotation players uh, and some draft picks, uh, that would take some of the burden off the guys that are there. But uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but uh, hopefully for their sake, uh, they uh, they figure it out soon because I don't know that the, the fast start they've gotten out to is sustainable, as you said, uh, once they get into the meat of the season. Well, let's, uh, this is Rick Graham Snyder in Kingston Community Radio. Feel free to call in, 331-9255. I'm here with Greg Herrin, NBA expert, uh, uh, and uh, let's let's skip to the finals, Greg. Let's let's assume that uh, the Nets and the Lakers, uh, although they're probably the two oldest teams in the league, you know uh, they make it to the finals. Uh, let's say uh, KD, Harden, and my pick uh, Kyrie coming back. Uh, how do they stack up against LeBron, uh, uh, Anthony Davis, uh, Russell Westbrook, and uh, our old friend Carmelo? What what do you see if that happens to be uh, the NBA final, which uh, would be a pretty high profile final, obviously? Uh, personally, I, I would pick the the Nets to get to the finals in that scenario. I, I'd be pretty surprised if even Milwaukee at full M- Milwaukee at full strength would, would definitely uh, make for a good series with the Nets. Uh, Miami, Philadelphia. I mean, those are the only other teams that could probably serve as a speed bump for the Nets. But I mean, it, you know, if Kyrie comes back and they stay healthy, I mean, they're far and away the most talent. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I think uh, you know this might not. Uh, the right answer to your question, but I think I, I'd uh, I'd more likely see uh, the Golden State Warriors or the Denver Nuggets in the finals than the Lakers. Uh, I think the Lakers have some issues uh, that I don't necessarily know that Russell Westbrook solved. Uh, you know, it's it's hard having a point guard who isn't necessarily a great shooter, and I mean LeBron needs to dominate the ball, and Westbrook needs to dominate the ball. So I don't necessarily know if that's a great fit. Obviously, they're very old, uh, and and to be fair, they have had some injuries. Uh, you know, Taylor and Borton Tucker is one of the young guys on their roster who was going to be a part of their rotation who hasn't been there. He's had a hand injury, so I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to make uh, proclamations eight eight or nine games into the season. The fact that they've lost two games already to the Oklahoma City Thunder, who are probably the worst team in the league, uh, and they've blown nineteen plus leads in both of those games to lose those games. Uh, doesn't inspire much confidence. I mean, I know the Nets last year lost to to the Cleveland Cavaliers twice. Uh, I think you were at one of those yeah. games. So I mean, it's uh, you know, it, it's hard to read a lot into the regular season. But I, I I look at a team like Golden State and I say, okay, you've got Steph Curry, you've got Clay Thompson coming back, um, maybe in early December. So I mean, we might only be a month away from seeing Clay Thompson come back. Um, Jordan Poole's emerges as uh, another uh, backcourt scoring option. He had 31 the other night. Uh, Wiggins, if not asked to be, uh, you know, one of your top players, if he's your fourth option, is still pretty good. You've got Draymond Green. You're going to get James Wiseman back from injury. Uh, Jonathan Kuminga is probably going to uh, make an appearance at some point soon. He was banged up uh, in the off season, so they're bringing him along slowly. There's a lot of talent and a lot of young talent on that. Uh, that Warriors roster, and, and there's a lot of shooting. I think the thing that concerns me with the Lakers is that they don't necessarily have a lot of shooting. I mean, no one is ever going to confuse LeBron for uh, for Larry Bird shooting the ball, and uh, and Westbrook's not a great shooter, and Anthony Davis is always injured. Uh, but, I mean, look, they, they're still talented. They, they'll still be in the final three or four teams out west. Uh, I mean, you're probably looking at, uh, Utah, Golden State, Denver, and the Lakers as as probably your your top teams out west. So I mean, they're certainly going to be there. It would be a, a high profile matchup. I think everyone would love to see LeBron and KD go at it in the finals. Uh, I'd have more faith in KD getting to the finals at this point, just because I think uh, age is starting to take its toll on LeBron. And uh, given the uh, the nature of Anthony Davis's injury history, uh, I think that there's there's more to overcome in getting them to the finals healthy than maybe the Nets getting their healthy. Well, it'll be interesting to see. So uh, uh, for those of you that uh, like uh, 
somewhat of a long shot uh, bet, you can go to Nuggets. I mean, they do have the MV, reigning MVP, but we'll see. Uh, we got about five minutes, Greg. Let's let's go uh, across the river from Kingston, where our studio is, and uh, uh, go over to Marist College. Uh, after 13 straight losing seasons, the Red Foxes, um, which I, it's kind of ironic, they've, and you know how, mu- how much I think of uh, Marist head coach John Dunn. I think he does a fantastic job. But the first winning season since 2008 last year, John and his team went 12-9. and nine. Nobody saw it. <laughs> because there was nobody in the, unless you're watching uh, uh, ESPN three, uh, there was no fans in the stands. Fortunately, this year uh, there will be. So they had a, a turnaround season, twelve and nine. I know, being a Marist alum, you must have finally taken some satisfaction that the Red Foxes finally got one on the right side of the ledger. Oh yeah, absolutely, and I and I was one of those people. I don't know uh, how many or how few were watching, but I was watching on ESPN three and ESPN plus, so I, I saw most of their season last year, um, and it was enjoyable. I mean, again, you know, I'm going back to a time where, uh, you know, ten years ago they were losing uh, twenty five to thirty games in a season. I think that, I think they had one year where they won one game uh, under Chuck Martin, uh, if I recall correctly. So you I do. Mean, you call exactly. recall correctly. <laughs> yeah. And so I mean, it's it's definitely a great turnaround. I mean, I, I remember uh, both covering Marist and then coming back after I graduated and, and watching them play St. Peter's uh, once or twice, and I was always impressed by uh, the job that John Dunn did. And uh, so when they hired him, I thought that. Uh, that that was a real great get for for Maris, just because he always seemed to get a lot out of a roster. You, you would think that Maris would be able to attract players better than, than St. Peter's, and every time they played, St. Peter's was always uh, giving them the business, as it were. So, I mean, I thought that that was a good hire because they found someone who who knew the MAC and who had proven success in the MAC. Uh, it wasn't a gamble on on an outside uh, hire where it's you know a shot in the dark. I mean. They were getting a, a proven coach, and you know. And as you know, I mean, I, I'm a, a big proponent of defense, both in the college game and the pro game. And I feel like you can't win without it. So, I mean, uh, uh, bringing in a coach who's really intense on that end of the floor, I think, gives them uh, gives them a shot. And it looks like they have a lot of athletes coming back this year, uh, some returning players. And uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken, they were picked uh, third in the conference. So, I mean, I, I think that there's. Uh, there's a little bit of hype around the team, so uh, you know if if there are people out there who maybe uh, lost track of Maris throughout the years as they were struggling, uh, now might be uh, time to jump back on the bandwagon. Well, yeah, it's uh, and I've as you know I covered Maris for a number of years, and one of the more enjoyable uh, nights I have is uh, when you and I and Dan Reinhardt from uh, uh, from the other station here in Kingston. Uh, yeah, Radio he was on Kingston. here the other day, wasn't Dan? Or? Yes, he was. He was here Tuesday. Yeah, so we love going, uh, sitting in the press row and uh, uh, watching the Red Foxes. It's an enjoyable night. It's a very, um, uh, you know, it's a great atmosphere, particularly when they're winning, uh, which hasn't been too much lately. But uh, the price is right, and uh, there's nothing like for me, uh, Division One college basketball and the MAC is a great conference, right, Greg? Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to coming back again. As long as they're allowing people into uh, into the McCann Center, I'll be back there this year. I mean, it's uh, as you said, it's uh, there's nothing like seeing Division One basketball up close and personal, and uh, um, it is some good basketball. I mean, you know, you're going to see them play some good teams. I mean, as, as we've talked before, Iona, you know, is is going to be a uh, formidable this year. But uh, you know, Maris is going to be up there in the top three or four teams, and so it'll be. Uh, the atmosphere should return not only because people weren't allowed to be there last year, but the team should be pretty good. Yeah, I, I own it with Rick Pitino. It's going to be uh, pretty uh, tough to beat, but you never know in college basketball. One injury and uh, who knows. But uh, So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, you and I finally getting to uh, – uh, second je- second guess John Dunn's every time out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. But John is a tremendous coach, so uh, we we uh, we're 100 percent behind him. Well, Greg, it's been uh, really nice having you on uh, again. I appreciate it, 
and uh, we're going to have you back again. Uh, just be, and we'll see how your prediction goes with uh, with the Nets in the final against either uh, Golden State or the Nuggets, and uh, a lot of basketball between now and then. So I'm sure you'll be watching, and uh, I appreciate you coming on. I sure will be watching, and I appreciate you having me on, Rick. Thanks so much. All right. Take care, Greg. So we're going to take a break now, and we're coming back with uh, Harry Lipstein of uh, uh, Denizen Theater. We're really looking forward to talking to uh, Harry, and uh, so take it away, Dan. Okay, and thank you, uh, Rick Remsnyder, and a very, very special thanks to Greg Herenia for uh, um, coming in and updating us on everything Mid-Hudson Valley sports. This, up, this last portion of Kingston Community Radio has been brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Many locations throughout the Mid-Hudson Valley, one near you. 27 degrees still. Can't get above that 27 degrees. And um, we'll be right back after these messages. This fall, give us your best shot. Your photo of the Hudson Valley's autumn scenery could be worth $750. Enter Central Hudson's 9th Annual Fall Foliage Contest today. If your photo gets the most likes on our Facebook page, you win. Deadline to enter is November 5th. For contest rules and information on how to submit your photo, go to Central Hudson's Facebook page or visit centralhudson.com. <laughs> hey everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Tony Marmo from Norman Staffing, and we've been bringing together employers and job seekers since 1980. If you're an employer and have job vacancies, let Norman Staffing help fill them with permanent or temporary workers. We screen, interview, and recommend the best candidates for your company. We make the employment process easier and faster for you. Please call Norman Staffing for your employment needs at 338-9111, 338-9111, or normanstaffing.com. Hi, this is Shirley Stabe from Kingston, and I support Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. You're listening to WGHQ AM 920 and 92.5 FM, the home of Kingston Community Radio. My name is Dan Gatiss, and it is still 27 degrees here on this November 5th. And uh, it's going to be sunny to partly cloudy today with a high going up to 51 today. And uh, clear to partly cloudy tonight uh, with a low of 28. Mainly sunny, high of 52 on Saturday. Mainly sunny. It's going to be a nice day. Generally fair on a Saturday night with a low of 29. And uh, for the rest of the weekend on Sunday, we have a... Uh, uh, partly to mostly cloudy um, uh, day, but, you know, we got some sun peeking through, too, with a high of 53. Uh, partly cloudy skies on uh, Sunday night with a low of 34. This upcoming portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Sawyer Motors. Bob Circasano and the whole Sawyer Motors team on 166 Ulster Avenue in Saugerties, New York, 12477. Definitely visit them, see what they have on their inventory. But you can call them, too, at 845-247-5027. Now let's get back to the on-air studio with Rick Remsnyder and our new guest. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I have a feeling, I don't. It's, when are we going to get up to that 51 degrees? It's got a little slow getting up there, but anyway. <laughs> I know, it's, it's still very cold out, you know. It's uh, still it's just... Peaking up to about 30. <laughs> well, tremendous. Well, I'm very pleased to have on the air somebody I haven't talked to since I uh, retired over a year ago as a tourism director. His name is Harry Lipstein. He's the founder and producing artistic director of the Denizen Theater in New Paltz, and I'm thrilled to have him on. How are you this morning, Harry? Richard, I am thrilled to be able to be uh, able to talk about the Denizen Theater. As you know, I'm very passionate about it. 
I know you are, and uh, I. You, I'm going to ask you to get a little background in the theater, but I have to say that uh, when it, when I first heard about the dentist and I was living in New Paltz, and uh, the concept of the uh, black box theater, it's for those who have not been there, maybe it's in the Water Street Market in New Paltz, and I was really excited at the concept, but I got even more excited when I met you, because when it comes to enthusiasm, I think you're one of the most uh, enthusiastic people I've ever met. So uh, you're certainly a great promoter of that theater. So uh, how things been going? Uh, spectacular. And and, the, and some of the reason, uh, if I can share with your audience, for that passion, uh, what we're doing is nothing different that wasn't done throughout time, which is the art of storytelling. It's in our DNA. It's in our sinew. We used to sit around the fireplace, listen to stories. A uh, visitor would come from afar. We'd ask them, where have you been? What have you seen? And, and then around that fire, we would hear stories, use our imagination. That art form, that storytelling is in all of us so that when you go to Broadway, when you go to off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway, that's what that storytelling will uh, help us uh, re 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 acquaint ourselves with, and the most important thing about live storytelling in theater for your audience, it is the only art form that has been proven. We have the technology now through brain scans to raise empathy in the world. Uh, I call it the great fake out. We all go to theater to get entertained. We want to listen to a story. What we don't realize as we're seeing a story unfold in real time. This isn't a recording. It's not music. We're watching stories unfold. You may have lost a loved one. You may have had just got an argument with your boss. We watch that and we think we're entertained when in fact it's connecting with our empathy center of our brain. We walk out of a theater performance, a more empathetic human being. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. Uh, currently, you asked me how the theater's doing. We just opened up after 18 months of not having a live show in a professional theater venue to a powerhouse show that's still running, by the way. It's going to run through November 21st at the Denizen Theater in New Paltz at Water Street Market. It runs Thursday through Saturday, 7 p.m., Sunday matinee at 2. So tonight we have a show at 7 p.m. It is a powerful show written by an Albany playwright, a talented Albany playwright, Jennifer Fawcett, who wrote a one-woman play. And if I tell your audience the construct, it's, it's amazing. This talented actress from Kingston, a professional actress from Kingston, will prepare an apple pie during the course of the show <laughs> at the request of her son. It just so happens, and I'm not giving anything away, the son is in prison, and this is his last meal request on death row. So this mother who's preparing her son's last meal, an apple pie at his request, will tell you the story behind how she is there it is powerful it is funny believe it or not and it also makes me cry it is some performance and i'm so proud the audiences we have not had a show since we opened we opened two weeks ago where the audience has not stood up after the show for a spontaneous standing ovation i'm so proud of this production is this uh, apples in winter Yes, it is. Apples in winter. I, you'd think I would at least mention the name. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> so, so, so appropriate. Apples in winter as we uh, approach here in the Hudson Valley, almost uh, freezing temperatures. Apples in winter are, in fact, uh, is, is the name of the play, but it also is so appropriate for the time we are in right now. We've partnered with a few of the local uh, apple orchards, they're supplying the apples every night. 
this woman is making a fresh apple pie. They're supplying the apples for our production. It is a community event. It's something that anywhere, I would say, go see it. The fact that we have a professional theater in the Hudson Valley, there hadn't been a new professional theater built in the Hudson Valley in over 20 years. This is a extraordinary uh, experience, particularly, and I say this uh, during post-COVID, we are in a world where we're being isolated, alienated for all the reasons that are appropriate, but for humans to not be able to connect as humans is an, uh, a, 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 an actual uh, uh, been studied will uh, ultimately create havoc, loneliness. So to be able to gather with your community safely in our theater, uh, we generally seat between 60 and 80 uh, seats. We've reduced our capacity. Everybody in the theater wears a mask. It is such a beautiful communal event in our community to see live professional theater. And as you know, Richard, we have had an exodus from New York these are people that are used to seeing theater. These are people that literally are uh, uh, longing for that connection, and we're providing that at a very, very critical time. Well, it, you certainly do do that, Harry. Um, by the way, this is uh, uh, Harry Lipstein of the Denizen Theater. By the way, please go on their website. Denizen is spelled D-E-N-I-Z-E-N in theater, is uh, the theater with T-R-E at the end. So you can go on to denizentheater.com website, get all the information uh, about the uh, current production and Apples in Winter. And uh, uh, I've gone to three or four of your shows pre-pandemic. And uh, the thing that I, there's a number of things I like about what you do. First of all, it's such, you mentioned 60, 70 seat, uh, theater is very intimate. Uh, you kind of move it around. You have different uh, props where you can sit different ways. Uh, I've seen different productions there. Uh, and I love the fact that you use a lot of local talent. And you mentioned uh, uh, your uh, actor from Kingston. What is her name? Uh, Jennifer is, uh, it's interesting. She was crowned, our actress is named Jennifer, our playwright is Jennifer Fawcett. Jennifer from Kingston, professional actress, uh, it was named Miss Ulster County and had a little controversy around her name, which was, uh, way back in the day. When she was named Miss Ul Ulster County, she's now a mature woman. Uh, she also had, uh, uh, uh it was involved with a film where she went topless. They tried to strip her of her Ulster County, Miss Ulster County crown. It actually became national news back in its day. She was recrowned Miss Ulster County because she stood up for her rights. Powerful performer. I couldn't, uh, I can't say enough things about it. Uh, Richard, you mentioned something which I want to share with your audience. It is Denizen Theater. Denizen. The name was not come up uh, uh, or brought up just flippantly. Denizen is an inhabitant of a community. We talk about sitting around the fireplace telling stories. Denizen, the literal definition, is an inhabitant of the community. If you go up to the building, which is an extraordinary concrete structure at Water Street Market, at the side of the building, we've deconstructed that word, den means home and security. It's right by our stage door. Zen, spiritual, uplifting. It's just above a beautiful garden with daisies. In the middle is I, is a bench there. Den, I, Zen. And it's connected by I. Den is home and security. Zen, spiritual, uplifting, connected by I. And as we sit there, we realize denizentheater.com is doing live theater. And as you mentioned, Richard, there's something extraordinarily powerful when an audience member sits six, eight, ten feet away from actors as they go through this fictitious world as spun by the playwright. 
you're, you could be in your kitchen, in your family room, entertaining an uncle, a loved one. That's what you're watching. When we go see these big extravaganzas on Broadway, it is extraordinary. It is a sensation. That is a different product. Anybody that has not experienced black box theater, which means the purest form of theater, needs to come to Water Street Market, needs to come to the Denizen Theater. Why? Because it's an experience that is so different than what we think of. People that say, oh, yeah, I've been to theater. I, I You know, I'm not, I'm, it's not for me. You come and hear these stories in real time. The one that I mentioned, Apples in Winter, about a mother making an apple pie. You'll watch her making an apple pie for her son as she tells her story. You're there with her. You're in a prison kitchen as uh, uh, visualized by the scenic designer, as supported by professional lighting, sound, props, costumes. Everybody at the Denizen Theater is paid. It's all professional. And as you mentioned, Richard, there's plenty of talent in them there hills. And the Hudson Valley is steeped with artists. We know the tradition of artists in the Hudson Valley. Well, all we, we are 90 miles from the biggest theater capital in the world, New York City, Manhattan. And guess where most of, if not an overwhelming majority live? Right here in the Hudson Valley. No question about it. Um, this is Rick Ramsnyder, uh, and if you would like to call in and talk to uh, Harry Lipstein uh, from the Denizen Theater, 845-331-9255. Uh, Harry, I, I saw a production there, and uh, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you are very modest. You're you're a fantastic actor in your own right. What play was that? And uh, Oh, so. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you experienced that. That was a play called Companion Piece, written by a New York City playwright. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Companion Piece, I had the uh, privilege of uh, participating in. It was a three-character play. The reason I was gravitated to that role was that that role was a universal concept. It was about in each individual way, each of the three characters were experiencing profound loneliness. And what an appropriate uh, subject matter for our current time. I got uh, attracted to that role. I played a role named Leonard. He was a computer misanthrope into himself, not really able to fully experience uh, human uh, beings in real time. So I got attracted to the role, and it was done in such a beautiful way, uh, written in such a beautiful way, and we brought that talented New York playwright to the Denizen Theater. I'm glad you saw that uh, production. Um, this production that we currently have, Apples in Winter, I'm proud to say people are walking out. Richard, you have only two weeks left, uh, literally are saying, oh, my gosh, this is the best thing i've seen at the denizen i think i'd be number two <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's a great night out on, and i'm glad that you're back after uh, an 18 month hiatus because uh there's the you know the as i said before it's very professional uh productions that you put on uh it's affordable um you know i've been to broadway uh, there's nothing like going to a Broadway show, but the cost and uh, the uh, some of the uh, things that you have to go through to get down to see a production. Uh, this is so much easier, and uh, the and it's certainly worthwhile. And I encourage people to go. I know you have a great relationship with SUNY New Paltz. Talk about that a little bit, and. Uh, uh, how you've, uh, I'm assuming you must, before the pandemic, uh, you must have had students uh, uh, contribute to your productions, or at least you certainly encourage so them. Very, 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 very appropriate. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it is so, so we're located in the village in New Paltz. Uh, for people that don't know the village in New Paltz, it is one of the most unique communities along with our other Hudson River towns, but New Paltz is unique in, in, in so many ways. 
it's adjacent to 50,000 acres of uh, open space preserve, uh, Mohonk preserve. Uh, it, 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 to be, have a village that has a river to ridge trail that you just cross the bridge. So you have a village of 8,000 residents that have access to 50,000 acres of nature. It's, it's just amazing. The river to ridge trail opened just a couple of years ago and it is by far the most uh, important umbilical cord to the village. But as you mentioned, not but, and we also are home to SUNY New Paltz, close to 8,000 students with all the commensurate professors and support people that support an 8,000 student SUNY. And they can walk down the hill to a village and see professional theater in their own village for every show, every student, any time, $5. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit we're committed to the next generation of theater goers. I'm so proud to say that we've had thousands of students see professional theater in their own village, high school students, SUNY New Paltz college students for $5. SUNY New Paltz has an extraordinary, most people are not aware of this, theater program where the professionals of Broadway, lighting designers, stage managers, uh, sound designers are coming from SUNY New Paltz and working in New York City. We have that powerhouse SUNY New Paltz in our village. And as a not-for-profit, we're committed, any student, anytime, $5 student tickets. It's a recipe for disaster as a not non-for-profit. However, we get support by thing, uh, beautiful uh, institutions like Ulster Savings Bank, Sawyer Savings Bank, Bank of Green County, Orange Bank and Trust. They say, you know something, we support the Hudson Valley. We support the arts. And they stand by us and support our $5 student program. Otherwise, we could not do it. In addition, we have currently, every production we try to bring in, SUNY New Paltz students. We have a, a, a marketing major, major who's doing an internship, getting credit, plus we pay her as a marketing intern to work at the Denizen Theater. She's been working on, and I encourage people to go on our website, denizentheater.com. Denizen Theater, spelled R-E dot com. Look at our website. A student who is an intern from SUNY New Paltz, Emma, has worked on our website, has put input on how to promote a play in the Hudson Valley, and is being paid as a professional, first paid professional job as a professional theater person right in our own village. And Richard, I want to point out, most people don't realize, but when you put on a show, when you put on a play, we're an incubator for employment. We hire and pay everybody. And I'm going to go partially through the list because most people are not aware. To put on a production, you have props, costume designer, sound designer, lighting designer, stage manager, assistant stage manager, front of office, box office. You have a director. You have actors. And I've given you a partial list. There's a scenic designer. There's a set designer. There's a technical designer. This one-woman show you're going to see is backed up by dozens of professionals that were paid in the Hudson Valley by a not-for-profit. I can't be more proud of what we do there. It's located right at Water Street Market, which I have to point out for your audience, if you've not been there, you could go to Water Street Market, have a meal at Parish, overlook the Shawanagunks, walk across the parking lot and see a show at 7 p.m., you can walk up Main Street and eat at any of the dozens of restaurants, see a show, walk to a theater, and drive home all in one evening. It is a spectacular composition. You've been there, Richard. You could speak to it. Oh, I, look, I'm, you're preaching to the choir. I, I love your, uh, your enthusiasm. Uh, uh, you know, in, in another life, you could have been Ulster County's tourism director because you... Uh, <laughs> You're saying the same th things that I used to say, but uh, I got to say, Harry, you got to, uh, the middle of September, uh, there was a tremendous article uh, in the New York Post 
Uh, it was uh, you can uh, Google it. Certainly, it's uh, yeah. It, it says I bought a, a bunker in New Paltz and discovered New York's best small town by Margie Conklin. And there's a a lot of uh, great article about New Paltz, some fantastic pictures uh, of the Denizen and uh, the Cronin Gallery and Water Street Market. Uh, Love Melanie and Ryan Cronin. Melanie was uh, on our tourism advisory board to do a tremendous job. So that was a nice shout-out from the New York Post. Absolutely. And the New York Post is doing nothing other than acknowledging what I am sharing with your audience, which we already know here in the Hudson Valley. What a unique place to live. New Paltz has been described, and I thought it was a bit of hubris when I first heard it. Uh, this is going over 25 years ago. They said New Paltz is like a mini Boulder, Colorado. But interestingly enough, having visited Boulder, there's, I'm going to say New Paltz is actually much uh, better uh, in its composition. There's very, very, very few uh, villages that have the privilege of a SUNY uh, university of close to 8,000 students literally in their village as you're able to avail yourself to nature unfettered, 50, 000, over 50,000 acres walking distance. It's almost unheard of in any composition. Kingston has its own unique characteristics. Beacon has its characteristics. Poughkeepsie. But what... New Paltz has going for it is one of the most unique compositions. One of my other lives was architecture. What we studied is called something which is neo-traditionalism, uh, new urbanism. And these villages throughout the United States, they tried to replicate what New Paltz is, which is an ability to live in a village with culture, with restaurants, with socializing, with the ability to walk on the streets and see your neighbor and have access to 50,000 acres on foot. It's uncalled. It's, it's, it's such a unique uh, community. If you've never been to New Paltz, come. Water Street Market is right on Main Street. The Denizen Theater sits within Water Street Market, which Richard knows is made up of independent shops there's no Starbucks in our, our complex. There, you're not going to find any big box store. These are people that have made a living in New Paltz for the last 20 years. We have a Himalayan shop. We have the Cronin Gallery. We have the one of the smallest wine bars, Jard, in the Hudson Valley. It is a uh, wine bar where six, eight people would sit at the bar. It feels like Cheers, Parish Restaurant. There's a coffee shop by a husband and wife team that have been there for 20 years. They raised their children at Water Street Market. Michelle and James, you can go there and James will cook you up some of the best meals and get a great cup of coffee. Water Street Market and Denizen, uh, I can't say enough about New Paltz, but more importantly, go see a show. There's only two weeks. We only have tonight's show included eight shows left. Every night, the audience get up, gets up to a standing ovation, and literally, I can't be more proud of this show. Richard, you saw Companion Piece. Uh, Kevin Armato was the playwright. Thank you. The brain still works. Uh, <laughs> and th- that, that play was extraordinary. This will uh, bring you to your feet in our village for professional theater, and it's it's, it's such a timely piece. It's such a beautiful piece. It will make you laugh, and it also makes me cry. How do we join the Zen Den? Ah, good question. Thank you. Who asked that? Uh, that I'm uh, the announcer. So I'm, I'm following your uh, website right now, and um, I had two questions. The uh, Zen Den sounds like a lot of fun. And then also up next, Marlo, Goethe, Faust, John Peelmeyer. Thank you so much for asking that. Uh, and your voice is extraordinary, by the way. I'm going to make an actor out of you. Um, I'm there. So, uh, <laughs> good deal. No, seriously. Um, uh, sometimes in life, and it's no different than uh, days of old where a actor, actress would go to California and be discovered, they have a quality. Your voice has a distinct quality. It is awesome to hear. Um, thank you for asking about the Zen Zen. Zenden is our way of having our audience be able to help us and give back. 
for ten dollars a month a mere ten dollars a month we call it ten dollars a month i don't minimize that you can join the zen den zen den says we recognize the work that you're doing we recognize the fact that a not-for-profit theater needs help but more importantly we want to be part of this community so we find ways to gather as a community apart from the shows we have gatherings at the theater you're introduced to playwrights to directors you get an inside view. How does it? Wh- wh- how do you make professional theater? It's magic, and if you just peel behind the curtain, you see it's also fun. Our Zen Den members get access to that type of information. A mere, and I call it a mere, and I'm not minimizing it. Ten dollars a month. Some people give twenty a month. It's a something we started up that we're very, very, very proud of because the community, without the support of the community, without, without being a true inhabitant, as denizen literally means, then suddenly it's not as much fun. They say in theater, the most important character of any play is the audience. So without the audience, we have no play. To have an actor up there giving her all, to have a playwright giving the words that are extraordinary, means nothing if the audience isn't there. Zen Den allows us to gather as a community. Uh, coming up on Monday, and thank you for pointing that out, we have a talented, one of the most talented playwrights, you talk about talent in them, their hills, living in the Hudson Valley. John Peelmeyer wrote a iconic play called Agnes of God. It was turned into a movie. We commissioned John Peelmeyer to write a play for the Denizen Theater during the period we were dark because of COVID, so we're still supporting artists in the Hudson Valley. The manifestation of that commission, Monday, we are having that play reading at 7 p.m. at the Denizen. It's an opportunity for free to see a playwright unfold a brand new world premiere and watch the process to give feedback to the playwright. That's Monday, this Monday, 7 p.m. at the Denizen Theater. You could be part of one of the most exciting play development aspects, a brand new world premiere play right at the Denizen with the playwright, with the actors acting it out. After the play, as an audience member, the playwright wants to hear the audience's comments, will alter his play in accordance with feedback he gets from the audience. It's an extraordinary exchange. Well, Harry, uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I encourage people to get down there. We've got two weeks left to see Apples in Winter. If you want to see a a real cool event, Monday at 7, go down to Desen and see that uh, reading. And uh, I'm going to, at the end of the show, I'm going to give Dan Gaddis uh, your email address so maybe you guys can uh, hook up and uh, we'll see Dan on stage okay. one of these days. <laughs> can, I, can I offer, and I hope you get it, uh, we'd like to offer your audience uh, two free tickets, first caller that comes in. Uh, Richard, if you'd be able to coordinate that, anybody that calls in, uh, two free tickets to the Denizen Theater. Come and see a professional show in the Hudson Valley. Well, we'll do that. Thank okay, you. Okay, then, uh, folks, uh, call in after 8.30 um, and, um, and see if you can get your um, uh, two free tickets. Thank you very, very much, Harry. My pleasure. Thank you for having uh, me on the show. It is so important, but uh, I can't thank you enough. All right, Harry. We'll see you soon. You take care now. Take care. All right, Dan. Uh, we got Bob Baum coming up. Take a little break here, and uh, we'll be right back with Bob. Absolutely. Thank you. And you've been with us here at KCR, Kingston Community Radio, AM 920 and 92.5 FM, WGHQ. It's Friday, November 5th and about 30 degrees right now here in Uptown Kingston. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio has been underwritten by Sawyer Motors, Bob Circasano and the whole Sawyer Motors team. And they're on 166 Ulster Avenue in Saugerties, New York, 12477. Go there and see the amazing inventory that they have. Or call them at 845-247-5027. And we'll be right back after these messages. 
This fall, give us your best shot. Your photo of the Hudson Valley's autumn scenery could be worth $750. Enter Central Hudson's 9th Annual Fall Foliage Contest today. If your photo gets the most likes on our Facebook page, you win. Deadline to enter is November 5th. For contest rules and information on how to submit your photo, go to Central Hudson's Facebook page or visit centralhudson.com. Hey everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Tony Marmo from Norman Staffing, and we've been bringing together employers and job seekers since 1980. If you're an employer and have job vacancies, let Norman Staffing help fill them with permanent or temporary workers. We screen, interview, and recommend the best candidates for your company. We make the employment process easier and faster for you. Please call Norman Staffing for your employment needs at 338-9111, 338-9111, or normanstaffing.com. Hi, this is Scott Harrington from Hurley, and I support Kingston Community Radio because the people need a place to have their voice heard, and it's lost in corporate radio, so please keep listening and supporting our station. And plenty of sunshine today with a high of 51, mostly clear tonight with a low of 28, and Saturday mainly sunny again uh, with a high of 52. And uh, we've got um, a few clouds um, Saturday night, a low of 28, and uh, Sunday, intervals of clouds and sunshine in the morning with more clouds later in the day. And uh, Sunday night, a few clouds from time to time with a low of 34. This upcoming portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by the friends of Kevin Cahill. As a strong advocate of local broadcasting, Assemblymember Cahill urges you to support Kingston Community Radio, with your time and donations, your contributions. Keep KCR vital and on the air at FM 92.5, AM 920, and on the web at mykcr.org. Join Assemblymember Cahill and send your gifts of $10, $25, or more to Kingston Community Radio, Post Office Box 4364, Kingston, New York, 12402. Together, let's keep KCR alive. And... We're keeping KCR alive. We've got uh, Rick Remsnyder and Bob Baum in the on-air studio. Thank you, Dan. By the way, if anybody wants to uh, see some great theater, uh, Harry Lipstein of the Denison Theater just uh, graciously offered to uh, donate two tickets to uh, the uh, current production in uh, Denison Theater in New Paltz. So just call 331-9255. Nobody's called in yet, so... uh, Pick up those tickets. Uh, it's def- definitely a worthwhile uh, uh, trip to the Denizen. So yeah, very not- happy to see my longtime friend, Bob Baum. How's it going today, Robert? Good morning. Uh, we're on the right side of the grass. It's always a wonderful day. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, Bob said, uh, I, I got some donuts for you. And so he, I said, well, where's the box? And I didn't see the donuts. But he, on the cover of the uh, Best of Hudson Valley, there's something that I have never heard of, Dan. Maybe you have vegan donuts. Okay. All righty then. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we had we had donuts at uh, uh, Boy's Dairy uh, yesterday for the uh, uh, Christmas uh, fundraiser, and uh, they weren't vegan. I can tell you that. Uh, I, I I will hate take donuts any way they come. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, what's going on in the world of real estate? Well, it's heavy duty. Um, there's there's a lot happening. We, we've got a, I think a um, the housing market is sort of stabilized at this point, uh, and it's up way up. Uh, the commercial market, which is what I deal in, uh, is uh, also exciting. I manage uh, three strip malls, uh, two in uh, Saugerties and one down here in the Rondout. And we're down to one vacancy in each of the ones in Saugerties, and we have two vacancies left in Rondout. Uh, and these are spaces which have, 
I'd say over the last eight or ten years been vacant more than they've been occupied. But now we have a waiting list on things, which is a total different circumstance. Well, I'm aware of the one on the Strand because our office for tourism used to be down there, so I used to go buy it all the time. Where are the two strip malls you're talking about in Saugerties? Uh, Twin Maples uh, across from uh, Quick Check on, okay. on 9W. And um, that's actually got 10, 10 storefronts in it and uh, one vacancy. Uh, well, some of the stores in there. Uh, well, they're, they're businesses um, as opposed to retail okay. stores. Um, Shaman's Dawn is in there. They, they do um, uh, a wholesale operation, and they have a small retail store going to open shortly. They're one of our newest tenants there. And there's uh, a large child care facility, um, uh, a tax outfit, and there's a church in there. Oh, okay. But we have uh, three pad sites available out there they're uh three quarters of an acre an acre and a half and two and a half acres so we're looking for a uh walgreens cbs to make a move out on one of the larger pads and the largest one we're talking to a two a uh, couple of hotel developers oh great so things are active before i forget if anybody's interested in uh, inquiring about the property What's the easiest, what's your contact information? Uh, the best way is to call me directly, 845-242-2100. Okay. And I know that uh, in all my travels around the county, I see a lot of Bob Baum signs. So you can take a quick picture if you can't right. remember that number. Yeah. 242-2100, <laughs> that's an easy one. Yeah, I've, should I've had it for about 20 years. Um uh, and um, where's the second one? Second one is Saugerties Plaza, just up oh. the road. Uh, and uh, there's only one 4,600 square foot space left there. And uh, so everybody's pretty full. Uh, and uh, I have property over in, represent property in Millbrook as well, a six acre flower farm, oh. commercial property. So it's a broad spectrum of, of commercial that I deal in, uh, including. Uh, and not the least of which is uh, some pre-approvals on apartment development on Morton Boulevard. Uh, we're looking for a developer on that now. And uh, the ever-present 17 acres I've had represented for the last 10 years down on Lucas is finally going to get the, the last leg in municipal services. And the sewer line is going to be uh, committed now for next year. So we now have municipal water and municipal sewer on site. And uh, the we're looking at, I, my plan is for a 72 townhouse development. Oh. There. So we're looking for somebody on that too. It's only a $30 million project, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, um, I guess I wouldn't be breaking any news here to say that uh, there certainly is a, a need for housing in Ulster County. There's a waiting list in most apartment complexes. Yeah, well, I, I know only too well. My son was, uh, uh, he was offered a, a job uh, in a newspaper here in Ulster County, but, um, you know, sort of a starting position, but uh, it was impossible for him to make ends meet by, you know, uh, getting an apartment. So long story short, uh, he ended up, uh, fortunately, with another position uh, in a newspaper in uh, Hudson, and he lives in uh, Pittsfield, Mass., because the apartment's uh, you know, a little cheaper there, obviously. So I guess affordable housing is something that, um, are, are we going to see it eventually here in Ulster County? Probably, yeah. There's a big push for that. Good. Well, you know, it's something that we, we hate to see people leave the county because they can't find a, a, a place to live. Well, I'll give you a short story. Going back about 25 years ago, I looked at moving to another part of the country and took a long time off and drove around the country <clears throat> and uh, went into uh, uh, Colorado. And uh, I found a couple of communities up there very attractive college communities. Uh, I heard the last caller talking about Boulder and some sure. other areas. Durango, Colorado. 
was where I went, and I really loved it. Uh, and I met with people at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and we talked about things. And basically, they said, bring your money or bring your work, because <laughs> it's, there was no affordable housing there for people. Uh, and so we have to be careful of that. We, I think we're, uh, RUPCO is the big driving force for affordable housing down here. Sure. So you have a prime mover on that. Well, that's good. You know, it's, uh, and they've had a couple big projects. Uh, I've, I'm assuming the one that used to be uh, Ferraro's Bowling, uh, uh, that's got to be full, right? I mean, that's, uh, that was a RUPCO project on Broadway, right? Yes, it was, yeah. And I was part of the uh, sale of that at that time. How many units, by and large? Boy, I don't know. I, I'm, out of the, I'm out of the loop on what Rupco's doing there. But it's a, it's a nice-looking project. Yeah. No, it turned out really good. Uh, this is uh, Rick Ramsire with Bob Baum. Anybody want to call in, talk about uh, real estate, anything else, uh, more than happy to uh, take your call, 845-331-9255. We're still trying to give away those two tickets to the Denizen Theater. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the properties that you own, uh, you know, it, they're pretty stable at this point, other than a couple uh, little vacancies that you have. You, do you have longtime tenants there, or does it switch up a lot? Or It doesn't switch often. I want to set the record straight. I don't own those properties. Okay. I, I represent the owners. Right. Uh, but um, they are in long-term leases. Um, Generally, we look at five-year base and you know, five-year options. And uh, so everyone that I put in is on a five-year base initial lease with options at the end. Well, that's good. Well, I'm, s I'm sorry I misspoke there. We, uh, I think we have a caller here. Maybe somebody is uh, finally picking up those tickets. But uh, So, uh, Bob, you've been in the community uh, a long time uh, uh, how did you first get involved in real estate? Uh, first involvement was um, when I initially I purchased three houses for my children for their college education, and I was in my 20s. And um, doing that, uh, I talked with the realtor, and he said, well, I know you're an engineer with so-and-so company who I was with at the time. And he said, why don't you get your real estate license? It's a simple procedure back then. That was, what, 1968? Yeah, 1968. And uh, he said, get your real estate license and see what you can do. And um, so I worked uh, in it part-time initially for a number of years. Uh, and then I got transferred to New York and uh, – Still worked part time in real estate until I went full time in 2005. Oh, okay. So it's only been full time for the last 16 years. If right. I could put my thinking cap on this yeah. early in the morning. That's right. So how how has it uh, improved since then? Are we at a upward trajectory? Well, we're at, we're at. I suppose we're in an upward, still in an upward tra trajectory. Um, we, I've been through several cycles, up and down cycles, uh, and we do have cycles, typically. Yeah, 2009 I, couldn't have been an up right. cycle, right? And, <laughs> right. And, and uh, they typically happen about every 11 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. So kind of taking a look at where we are now, where we were in 2009, okay. you know. So I think we're seeing some stable things happening. What we didn't have in the last downturn was low interest rates. Right. So the low interest rates stabilize markets. Okay. Much more so on the downside. It, it'll stabilize it without going too far. All right, we have a caller. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we doing today? Good morning. Good, George. How are you this morning? I'm doing super. It's a little cool out there. Green Acres probably not going to open up to after the ten thirty again this morning like they did yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so the, the frost, frost is, is still out. out there and stuff. But uh, you did a super job yesterday morning at Boise's and everything. 
Well, thanks, George. It was nice to uh, have you stop by and make a nice donation to the Christmas fund. So uh, it was a pretty good setup there, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, great setup. And you was right. Those donuts were good. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, Bob, I know that property that you're talking about up in Trim Maples, that would be a great site for somebody because it got plenty of uh, parking and stuff. It has uh, traffic flows by on 9W all day long, and because uh, I used to work at that tax outfit that was there. I, mean, oh, I won't right. mention the name, but, yeah, it's, so, hey, that is a great location for anybody who wants it or who wants to move in, because I can remember there used to be a fantastic uh, Chinese restaurant that was there, too, on, on the end. That's true, and they're still there. Oh, they are still right. there, okay, because I thought they might have closed. They may uh, have gotten back in again, but... Uh, no, that's great property, and like you said, affordable housing in this area is extremely tough to find, and uh, they uh, need to work on that. And also, with the businesses opening up, New York State needs to get rid of a lot of the red tape that they have to go through to be able to open a business. And, well, I uh, would certainly do agree with that. Do what you do, so you guys have a great day, and uh, I'll catch you guys later. Well, George. Thank you. We appreciate you calling in. It's going to warm up next week. I know you'll. I know you play till the middle of December. So I'll see you out at the Acres. Uh, unfortunately, next week I'm booked up with everything going on with uh, veterans groups and everything. All the rates from Tuesday through uh, Friday. <laughs> yes, Veterans Day is November 11th. Correct. Yep, Thursday. Yep. And uh, so, hey, if you get a chance, go to some of your local American Legion posts where they'll be doing uh, Veterans Day services. And they all start at 11 a.m. So right. have a great day. Oh, have a terrific thank you, weekend. Thank you, George. Take care now. Yep. Bye. So, uh, yeah, he's uh, um, George is an avid uh, golfer at Green Acres. And uh, I see him. I won't be seeing him this morning, though. I'm one of those guys. I don't know about you, Bob, but I need at least 50, 55 degrees before I'm going. I back. have to agree with that. So, uh, yeah, that, uh, that Chinese restaurant's still there in a the strip mall. We don't want to yep. make, make sure people know about that. So uh, what's going, what else is going on with you these days? Just uh, taking a hard look at uh, the growth in the area and, and um, trying to keep a handle on um, all of the phone calls that come in. Uh, we had one earlier this week. Uh, one of our co-brokers uh, uh, upstate has a buyer for a portfolio of apartment complexes. And a portfolio they're looking at is between 25 and 30 complexes. Mm. So you extrapolate the numbers a little bit, you're looking at a four or $500 million investment. So... There's a lot of people down here scouting around for apartment complexes which might be available for sale, but very few portfolio operators. They're generally more national in scope. It's, an, it's an, just an interesting concept to, to actually get involved in a project like that. Well, before I go there, I just want to mention I'm happy that uh, Meredith Van Etten uh, called in, and I'm going to, uh, she's good for the two free tickets to the Denison Theater for Apples in Winter. I will um, talk to Harry Lipstein of Denison, and we'll figure out, I'm sure they'll be available at the box office, and uh, uh, so we'll uh, set you up there, Meredith, and uh as soon as I hear from Harry, I'll give you a call, to, so make sure you know about that. So um, thank, thank you for calling in. Um, what, at this point in time, Bob, makes Ulster County uh, attractive for new businesses, in your opinion? What is it uh, that is uh, happening here in the county? Well, I think the kickstart was the influx of people from south of here, um, understanding fully what the mountains and the water base we have up here, the, uh, the clean air, the views, uh, I think that's a big draw. Uh, and the fact that we have a 
close proximity to other places, an hour to Albany, um, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes to Lake George, uh, an hour and a half to New York City. We're positioned in between and in a good spot here. So that's what I think the draw is. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because um, the in the last, I'll say, half dozen years, uh, working uh, with with the media in New York City, it it just seems like at least uh, once a month or even more than that, you'll get an article from, like just uh, this morning. I don't know if you're listening or not. There was an article in the New York Post talking about New Paltz and all the great things that are going on in a small town like the Denison Theater and the you know the galleries and everything there. New York Times, uh, a huge spread not that long ago. So uh, the, the, being 90 uh, minutes from Midtown Manhattan, there are a lot of transplanted New Yorkers and business owners obviously relocating here. Uh, and uh, the exposure that uh, Ulster County has gotten uh, uh, has been unbelievable. It has. It That's true. And I did hear some of that conversation about New Paltz having been a New Paltz resident for some 16 years. I didn't. I left New Paltz in, what, 96, I think it was, and moved up here with my business at the time. Uh, but, yeah, uh, New Paltz is a tremendous draw as well. And it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to come up to the next exit for Kingston. Well, that's one of the things is, uh, we've talked about is uh, we're very fortunate here in the county to have three stops on, off the New York State Thruway. I mean, New Paltz, Kingston, and Saugerties. Right. I mean, it's so convenient uh, for travelers uh, f- uh, south of here. So that's got to be a huge draw. Yes, right. Absolutely true. So um, what, you know, it, it's interesting uh how long has it taken uh, to f- uh, the commercial properties and that to get over the pandemic? Have we gotten, has that been, are you getting f- fairly close back to normal as far as uh, being able to uh, rent places and, and get people into uh, some of your properties? Has, did it take a little bit of time? It took a little bit of time, but it <clears throat> it flattened out right away. Um, uh, I see no no pullback at all in interest in properties. Uh, I haven't had a problem with anyone coming up and being concerned about that. They have a business. They want to get going. They want to jump on the bandwagon, and uh, that seems to be what's happening right now. I mean, there was, uh, there's not a lot of things that we can say came out of good, came out of the pandemic, but obviously Ulster County, uh, a lot of people from the city uh, wanted to get out of New York right, City. Right, right. N- not only uh, businesses, but their homes. So uh, in that regard, I guess uh, uh, it certainly uh, helped uh, the sales, uh, the real estate sales uh, here in the county. Uh, right, I, absolutely. I see every day that how, how much... Uh, if you'd want to sell your house, uh, I sold my house about just before the pandemic. Not good, not great timing. <laughs> I should have hung on yeah. a little bit, but yeah. that's something that certainly happened, right? Sure, sure. No, I, I see um, everything looking up as far as that's concerned. I listened to part of the conversation about the restaurants that the prior gentleman was talking about. Um, a number of restaurants were closed because of the COVID because they couldn't deal with it. They couldn't deal with a lot of things. But uh, there's a lot of business out there for the restaurants. And the ones that weathered the storm are doing mostly all doing quite well. Have you been to Moonburger yet? No, I haven't. <laughs> well, man, you might want to show up a little before dinner time, like maybe five ish, if you could do a little early uh, dinner there. I've seen the lineup of cars. They're doing very well. Yeah. Well, I can't believe that we've almost uh, come to the conclusion of our half hour with Bob Baum. Bob, it's always a pleasure to see you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Hope Thank you for the on. opportunity to see you guys once again. I appreciate it. Anytime. We'd okay. love to have you here. So, Thanks for uh, all the signage, Bob. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think we may have a budding actor here, Mr. Dan Gaddis, uh, right. so, uh, with that profound pipes that he has there. So I'm going to put him in touch with Harry Lipstein. So, Dan, thank you. Uh, have a great weekend. It's always great seeing you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Bob Baum, and um, all of our guests today. We've had uh, some uh, pretty extraordinary, um, pretty extraordinary guests today. And um, you've been with us here at KCR, Kingston Community Radio, AM 920 and 92.5 FM. Our um, guests today were Greg Herringa and Harry Lipstein and Bob Baum. And, of course, Rick Remsnyder. Thank you so much. Um, how can we thank you for everything you've done for Ulster County and uh, surrounding areas? Thank you for sharing the morning with us and participating in Kingston Community Radio, KCR, AM 920 and 92.5 FM WGHQ, and our live streaming on mykcr.org. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio was brought to you by the friends of Kevin Cahill. As a strong advocate of local broadcasting, Assemblymember Cahill urges you to support Kingston Community Radio with your time and donations. Your contributions keep KCR vital and on the air at FM 92.5, AM 920, and on the web at mykcr.org. Please join Assemblymember Cahill and send your gifts of $10, $25 or more to Kingston Community Radio, Post Office Box 4364, Kingston, New York, 12402. Together, we are keeping KCR alive. And we invite you to be with us next Monday morning um, uh, for, a, uh, for a Medical Monday, and we wish you every success in growing and developing Kingston and all our neighboring communities we now return you to Magic 92.5.